Hello and welcome to the wonderful talk, History of the Mainframe, where we'll, we'll learn something about, I'd say, old and current hardware. And um, we have the wonderful, I forgot the names, sorry, Claudio and... Nico. Nico, thank you. <laughs> and I'll just hand over to them and enjoy the talk. Yeah, hi and welcome to our talk. We're going to lead you a little bit through the history of the mainframe. Um, we're going to start at the S360 and go right back into the yeah, current time, Linux. But before we do that, let's first um, say who we are. My name is Nico. Uh, I'm a developer for KVM on S390. I'm also a co-maintainer for KVM unit tests on S390. Hello, my Hi, my, my name is Claudio. I am one of the co-maintainers for KVM on S390 and one of the co-maintainers for the KVM unit tests on S390. Yeah, so first of all, let's answer the question, what is a mainframe exactly? And that term originates from a time where computers were made out of several boxes, so to say. You can say racks today, maybe. There was one box that was the power supply, there was one box that was the tape drive, there was one box that was the hard disk, there was one box that was the actual CPU. And this box that contained the actual CPU, that was the heart of the whole computer, the mainframe. So that's where the term originates from. And um, at some time, that term became so common that we, that we, people started to refer to the mainframe as like the computer. So the mainframe designates like a computer architecture um, that started somewhere in the 60s. And um, Claudio is going to introduce you what that meant and how that came about. Yes. So <laughs> we start in the 50s, uh, late 50s, beginning of the 60s. Um, there were many manufacturers of computers or different types of computers, big, small, and um, they were all different and all incompatible. Even the same vendors sold many different lines of uh, systems that were incompatible. Maybe, maybe the systems had like some small variations, like you had maybe the same version, like slightly faster, slightly more AO, a few more, a little bit more memory, but it was more or less the same system. And if you wanted to m move to a significantly bigger system, then it was a completely different new type of uh, system, different, ar different architecture, different instructions, different operating system. Operating systems were written for that specific type of machine, and they were not compatible one with, with the other. They were very closely modeled after the hardware itself. Uh, and the drivers, for, even for the cases where you had the same hardware attached to different machines, in that case, even that case, the, hard the drivers needed to be rewritten from scratch. And that mean it meant that moving f your software from a specific machine to maybe even a bigger one meant completely rewriting it. Everything was different. The OS interfaces were different. The programming languages even were different, and, and the machine code. It was a mess, and it was a mess also for vendors themselves because uh, each vendor had many different lines to cover the spectrum of you know possible mm, uh, performances that you w would co want to cover, and and they, they had to support many different um, uh, incompatible platforms. So also from for the vendor side, it was it was a huge mess. <coughs> so. What happened was that IBM realized that um, they were not exactly uh, on the leading edge anymore. Uh, there was strong competition, and uh, IBM wished to become just a company that sells computers, just like all the others. So a task group was created to address this issue, and the recommendation was to create a, a, um, a line of five compatible systems spanning a 200-fold performance range. And uh, surprisingly, I would say for, for these times it would be surprising, uh, IBM followed the advice and uh, did what uh, the task group suggested to do and uh, replaced the whole product line with compatible machines. The whole project was massive and estimated uh, uh, $675 million, which in the 60s was a lot of money, of which 30 million for software. But as things are, you, I mean, the, the, the thing went a little bit over budget. Uh, it ended up costing five billions, which for the time was an even more massive amount of money, of which 500 million just for software. Almost like the, the, the whole original budget was just for software, basically. And uh, toward the end of the project, IBM was in financial difficulties. Like, they literally didn't have sometimes the struggle to find the money to pay the salaries because they, they were like really, really, really um, uh, broke. Uh, thankfully, the mainframe worked and they made a 
bought a lot of money f uh, out of it. Like, but yeah. Uh, so that was a, a moment where they literally bet the company on the mainframe. If the mainframe had not been a success, IBM would, have, would not exist anymore. So, uh, what came out of, of this thing? Some innovations, 8-bit uh, bytes, uh, the, there was no concept of byte at the time. Uh, there were characters, they were usually around 6 bits, because with 6 bits you could represent all the letters and numbers and a few more symbols. That was enough for the time. Uh, but uh, from the mainframe introduced the concept of 8-bit bytes, the concept of uh, an instruction set architecture. So you have an abstract instruction set architecture, you have your instructions, and then you have the machine implementing the instructions. And you can have a cheap machine or an expensive machine, a slow machine or a big machine, and it's the same instructions. You, you can take your software from the slow machine. If you grow, your company grows and you want to buy a new or rent a new or more expensive machine, you can just do it and move your software and it just works. Uh, solid, state, uh, solid logic technology um, was at the time an innovation to, to basically put small standardized uh, components on small um, cir uh, printer circuit boards, like some transistors or some resistors, some stuff in a specified um, configuration. So you ha would have standardized modules uh, for like XOR or you know whatever kind of uh, thing you wanted. So you could just build your stuff by slotting this standardized uh, things uh, and and another interesting thing was uh, again uh, hardware abstraction in the OS <coughs> so how does the s360 architecture look like first of all it's a big endian because at the time was the most logical and obvious thing because you write from left to right you big numbers first right so 24-bit uh, addresses um, and the consistent instruction formats two, four, or six bytes long, and the first two bits of the instruction indicate the length of instruction. And this is interesting because today, the modern mainframes still have the same system. You still have two, four, or six, and the first two bits indicate the instruction length. Take note, Intel. <coughs> uh, registers, 16, 32-bit general purpose registers, which was a lot in the 60s. If you think about the 8086 that came out roughly 10 years after uh, the, the first mainframe, they had half so many registers and they were half so big. Um, we have one program status word, which is uh, like a mix of program counter and flags, uh, some control flags, like interrupt flags, uh, whether we are in supervisor mode, like kernel mode or user space mode, and a few other things. And for 64-bit floating point registers, um, well, optional because, but, um, also take note that the registers are 32-bit, but the addresses are actually 24-bit. Yes. So that's important later. Uh, channel I.O. is interesting because it's not uh, anything like port I.O. or memory mapped I.O. or it's not even like DMA in the most understood sense um, because the device cannot just write into memory anywhere. There's a, a channel controller that uh, is programmed by the operating system and the device cannot just write in memory, it just communicates with the uh, channel controller and the channel controller writes in memory where the operating system told them to. So it's kind of like having a DMA with a built, kind of built in uh, IOMMU and that was there in, in, in the 60s already. Interrupt, classes and subclasses, protection, floating point, I will cover that in the next slide. Decimal uh, BCD arithmetic, this is interesting. 8-bit uh, bytes means that you can put two uh, base 10 digits in one byte, one per nibble, and then you can do base 10 arithmetic, for example, for banks or <coughs> COBOL. That was actually a very new thing at the time, COBOL, mm -hmm. so yeah. And then we have what we call that or dynamic address translation, virtual memory on a specific model, and uh, also had multiprocessing with multi CPUs. So, protection. Um, Paging, there, there was no virtual memory on most S360s, uh, but there was a mechanism for, to protect memory. Uh, storage keys, um, each uh, f a two kilobyte block of memory had an associated four bit value plus an optional fifth bit. Um, there was a four bit field in the program status word. Uh, if that field matches with the storage key of the m block of memory, then access is granted, otherwise, it's not granted. Um, optionally, flash protection. So Reading was allowed, but not writing, or 
even reading was not allowed depending on uh, the fetch protection bit if it was set as well or not uh, and the kid zero work could do everything like kind of like kernel mode uh, thing why is this in interesting to, to show because this is still there today actually uh, it's four kilobyte blocks now it's not two kilobytes but this same mechanism it's still there storage keys are still there linux doesn't use them but the hardware mm, has it so um, hexadecimal floating point is also interesting um, it's of course not IEEE compliant, mostly because the IEEE standard came out like 20 years later. So, yeah. And another interesting thing is that the long and short only differ in the size of the fraction. So, the range uh, was the same. It's just that the mm, longer one had more precision. And uh, the other interesting thing is that the exponent is not in base 2, but it's in base 16. So, the, it indicated in which nibble. The, the the floating point was not in which bit, no nans, no infinities, and um, there was some maxable interrupt that could mm, be used to, to to signal if something went wrong, like division by zero stuff like that. So, <coughs> um, these are two of the well, like w the small uh, one of the smallest and one of the biggest models of uh, S two sixty that uh, came out, and we can see that they 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 had a very very uh, different like a very wide range of, of performance from 10 kilo instruction per second to uh, 10 mega uh, mm, instruction per second so from very slow to for the time actually very fast from 8 kilobyte of memory which is very low to 4 megabyte and interesting is also to see the weight which was they were quite heavy they were almost 1 ton for the small model and the big model was from 6 to almost 13 tons and if you wonder why is such a w wide variation that de depends on the memory more memory means you need more of these gigantic steel frames containing the memory so more memory means it's actually heavier and bigger um, and needs more power um, yeah uh, the S360-67 had um, a virtual memory some control registers to uh, um, handle the virtual memory in UPSW format because the was was needed, four kilobyte pages and a TLB. And um, we looked at the documentation actually, and we looked at the documentation where went into very, very, very specific details of how the TLB works, how the, the, the new entries are formed, and how the all the entries are evicted. And it was very, very detailed. And we wondered why are they putting so much detail into how the TLB works? Such which I mean, who, 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 well, it had eight entries, so um, you needed to more write your software carefully to make sure that you wouldn't mm, trash the TLB all the time. So that's why it was so <coughs> detailed. Um, there was a bunch of operating systems written for the uh, S260. I uh, will cover some of them in, uh, in the next slides. I will not cover some of them because I'm uh, uh, not so interesting, but there's one I want to mention. Uh, it's the TSS360 uh, time sharing system. Um, it's um, the operating system that IBM wanted people to use uh, for um, yeah, time sharing, like uh, concurrent uh, interactive use of multi-user system. Like most of the other operating systems were uh, like for batch processing; they were not meant for uh, interactive use. And um, so IBM really put lots of resources into this TSS system, and um, didn't really work very well. Uh, I have read somewhere that like it took 10 minutes to boot and it would run approximately for 10 minutes before crashing. So <coughs> I don't know if it's true, but um, yeah. So, but IBM really pushed that, really, really wanted that to be successful. So um, the big OS 360 took a lot of time to, to, to develop because it was big and complex. So uh, uh, they decided to write a smaller uh, OS uh, to fill the gaps because they need to sell hardware and they need an OS. And so they write a small, um, a smaller operating systems. Then they realized that, oh, wait a second, the big OS uh, can, is actually too big and cannot run on smaller machines. So oops. maybe we should actually, yeah, oops. <laughs> so maybe we should actually keep the smaller OSs uh, and, uh, for the smaller machines. And um, also, some customers just invested in the smaller OSs and didn't want to switch. So, mm, yeah. BPS was actually not an OS, but just a collection of standalone um, programs that would run directly on a machine, like a compiler or stuff like that. Um, then there was a basic operating system that would run in, uh, in 8 kilobytes, so also in the smallest machines. TOS is a tape operating system, if you had tape but not a disk, because disks were expensive. And DOS the disk operating system, um, which could run in 16 kilobytes of memory. Um, it was 360, the flagship. 
uh, of for S360 mainframes, three variants, uh, all the same API, ABI, and job control language. Uh, PCP, a single task, uh, could run on uh, 48 kilobytes. Uh, MFT, meaning multi uh, uh, multi-programming with a fixed number of tasks, aka the memory was partitioned in fixed slices and you could run different tasks in different slices. Of course it was all batch processing, uh, so it was not interactive. And MVT, multi-programming with variable number of tasks, which was big uh, uh, and required a half megabyte of memory, which was actually a lot of memory at the time. Um, they all had uh, f uh, file name structures, like this, the file naming had a structure, so you could, you could have hierarchies and various form of remote access, except for the PCP, and subtasks, except for the PCP, and uh, actually the PCP was not, not even released in the final version of S360 because um, it's, it's like, mm, you can just use DOS, I guess. Um, so, yeah. Claudio, what could possibly go wrong if you have an operating system with a variable number of tasks, but no virtual memory? Memory fragmentation. Uh -huh. Yay. So what happened is that uh, memory could get fragmented, and uh, if a program needed more memory, they would just the OS would just figure out which uh, process to literally swap out to disk. So not a page, like the whole process would be swapped out and memory freed for another process, which was... Yeah, I mean, not exactly <coughs> super nice, but it worked. It worked. So, another interesting thing is the Cambridge monitor system, written by the uh, Cambridge uh, IBM lab as a single user operating system uh, and can run bar bare metal on S360. And people really liked it. People really liked the single user operating system, but they wanted. Um, uh, to have it kind of like multi-users, so they did the logical thing, and they wrote uh, a hypervisor to to uh, have a basically a virtual machine uh, and and run their single-user operating system and uh, inside the virtual machine. But you had multiple virtual machines, so you had a multi-user system, kind of logical, logical. logically, of course. Um, the virtual machine was a trap and emulate type of machine, and um, it ran the first version ran on a specific a specific. Uh, spe specially modified S360 40, which did not have virtual memory, but they literally hacked it. They literally hacked the ma microcode and the stuff to, to to have it, and it was used as a prototype for the actual um, uh, CP67 uh, control program 67. Uh, it was actually used in production, but not supported by IBM. IBM didn't like this this stuff. They wanted to push their TSS. Remember, they didn't like it. So they, they, so they, they never really supported it. They didn't really cared too much in the beginning about this. And eventually it became uh, VM370. VM stands for Virtual Machine. Um, and yeah. And the interesting thing is the Airlamp control program, um, real-time transaction oriented, not a general purpose OS, as in you cannot even compile a program on it. You need to cross compile for it. And uh, it's, it can do lots of transaction, transactions. So uh, airlines used it for reservations. And then banks were like, hmm, you can do transactions in real time. Hmm. So banks started using it. And then IBM was like, mm, maybe you should not call it airline control program. It's uh, more like a transaction processing facility. Yes, that sounds nicer. And it's still there. It still exists now. Uh, it's called ZTPF and uh, works on uh, 64 uh, uh, bit architectures. So 70s, new. Um, Evolution of the architecture, uh, S370 for the 70s. Visual memory was now part of the base architecture, but it was um, different than the S360-67, uh, different and incompatible. So you couldn't, you couldn't just take a operating system from the 67 and run it here. Uh, it supported both 2 kilobyte and 4 kilobyte page sizes. There were some other interesting things, like support for multiprocessing was built in. Um, pure. Later on, the architecture was extended with the extended architecture, which um, had a switchable per process 31-bit mode. Um, yes, it's not a typo, it's 31. If you wonder why 31, because, um, well, uh, we had 32-bit registers, so the, f the highest bit was used to switch between 31-bit and 24-bit for backwards compatibility. Um, at this point, only four kilobyte uh, pages uh, were supported for virtual memory and for storage keys. The channel I.O. was completely written, and there were also very nice vector instructions, which unfortunately I don't have the time to talk about, but they were very nice. Um, only for that specific model in the beginning. And then ESA370 architecture with address, uh, access register mode, which is a crazy thing that um, can be used to, to have like up to 256 address spaces at the same time in the same process. Um, it's still there in the architecture. Uh, it's, it's, it's 
quite complex. Um, and I watched a talk from GPN 2019 in case you're interested what that yes. is and how that works. I had a, I had a talk uh, and in, you can just watch the recording from, yeah, it, or, or ask us later. And the interesting thing is the LPAR logical partitions. You could slice the mainframe in um, logical partitions that behaved like completely separate machines. So you could run like production and testing on the same machine because they were actually two different partitions and they could not influence each other and it was stable and uh, it and it's still there by the way it's, it's um, in, in modern mainframes um, that was for the S270 so virtualization at some point IBM starts to realize that hey in virtualization maybe it's important so first in, in 1980 they had a um, um, uh, small extension to to allow uh, VM to run uh, faster and then in 84 with the um, S270 XA the start interoperative execution instruction, which is kind of like the VM start instruction that you have on modern machines, but uh, like on x86 machines, but that was like there in 84 already. And um, nested paging was supported like out of the box since the beginning. And most instruction executes inside without even an exit. And, and uh, there's a control block describing the, the guest CPU. And it's still there today. That's the instruction that uh, like KVM uses on S290 to, to run virtual machines. Um, so in the beginning were some clones that were more like copying instruction set, not exactly being a drop in replacement, uh, except for the Soviets that they actually wanted to clone it. And then in the 70s, um, one guy, uh, former IBM, uh, um, Gene Amdahl, um, formed the Amdahl Corporation and started selling drop in replacement for IBM mainframes. And some other companies noticed that and they were like, hey, we can do that too. And so they did. And um, it's a little bit embarrassing, but at some point, uh, some of the competitors uh, sold better hardware than IBM itself. Um, yeah. So this is an overview of the operating system. We can see the DOS on the left, uh, OS 360 that became MVS and then became OS 390 and then became ZOS, which is still there. Um, the control program, which is VM, which is now called still ZVM, TPF, and then we have a bunch of Unixes. So the first one is actual Unix. Uh, ported uh, with the help of AT&T, uh, working uh, inside TSS, basically using TSS as a um, supervisor, and the kernel was kind of running as a process inside TSS. And um, then also in the 80s, Amdahl Corporation, uh, they had a different port of Unix running inside VM instead. So to avoid interacting directly with the hardware, they uh, relied on, uh, on VM. And that was quite successful, and IBM had to kind of run after them. Um, so it was IX37 and VMIX, which were actually two different pieces of software. One more based on the Unix from above, and one was a different thing. I looked, I searched in the documentation, I digged into um, all, all the old documentation and, and uh, announcement. I couldn't really find much information about this. In 1988, AIX370 was released, so uh, again, a proper Unix, and uh, in... Um, 1991 AIX ESA, which could finally run bare metal and not necessarily inside VM. And then uh, the whole thing was kind of merged into MVS itself, into the flagship OS. Then Linux happened. And uh, 2001, there was Unix system services. So basically, IBM merged Unix inside ZOS. ZOS is actually POSIX compliant. And interestingly, in 2008, someone ported OpenSolaris for the mainframe, but the, it was a short-lived effort. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about the FV90, the further um, evolution of the architecture. So we get additional floating-point registers. We now have 16 in total. And additionally to the hexadecimal floating-point, we now learn the proper IEEE 754 floating-point format. So you can do both, um, whatever you prefer. Um, we also get a few additional um, instructions to work with immediate, to work with relative addresses. And I think the most mentionable thing is suppression and protection. And we need to look at what suppression and protection actually means. So um, if we want to talk about Unix, something very important that we need to talk about is the fork system call. And what a fork system call does is if you have a process and that process executes a fork system call, you get basically a second process that is identical to the first process.
And because copying a process basically means that you have to copy the memory and that would be slow, um, most operating systems do it, or almost all, all Unixes do it in, in the following way. You have the pages of the first process, these are read write, and then the process executes the fork, and in the forked process these pages become read only. And then what happens if the second process, the forked process, um, tries to write through one of these pages? Um, it tries to write, but the page is read only. So what happens? An exception is generated, and the operating system can do copy on write. It can copy the page and then perform the write on the copy. So the original contents of the page are not destroyed. And now what is an important thing to have for this to work is that this ex exception um, happens when the instruction that caused the exception did not really do something yet. So um, it must not happen that you do a write and then you, for example, cross a page boundary and then you get the exception just when you cross the page boundary because that would be bad and would mean that there would already be something written in the previous page. Um, so that's very important for Unix-based operating system. And S390 actually behaved that way. So S390, it could happen that you got the exception, but part of the ex uh, instruction was already executed. That's not so good. Um, so that makes it very hard to implement FOIC. So basically what you can say, S390 was not a very good fit for Unix-based operating systems. Um, we, yeah, so in February 1993, IBM realized that and added suppression on protection to the architecture, um, which basically meant when you get this exception, you're guaranteed that this write has not yet been executed and a few other things. What is kind of interesting is in 1993, there already was a Unix, right? How did they do that? We don't know how they do, did it. We assume that they had some internal knowledge on how the machine works exactly inside, so they could kind of work around it a little bit. Um, but yeah, it was probably very hacky, so it's good IBM introduced that. Yeah, but I know that for a fact that they did do copy and write because I looked into the documentation and uh, yes, they were doing copy and write somehow. So, ah. Uh. We don't know. <laughs> but yeah, the architecture now has support for suppression and protection. We can do proper Unixes on the architecture now. <coughs> Good, okay, so um, bipolar versus CMOS. Um, so bipolar and CMOS, these are two technologies, how transistors work, how CPUs are modeled, and mainframes, because they're so old, bipolar was there earlier, um, they're almost always traditionally based on the bipolar technology. And the bipolar technology that's interesting and that's very good because it's so fast you can switch your transistors really really fast but it has a striking disadvantage it's extremely hot so things run very hot when you use bipolar technology um, and IBM really really had to spend lots of effort to get rid of all the heat so at my university we always had a problem that the, co that the, the basement was always very cool and I remember asking the question guys why is it so cool here can't you do like the climate one one a little bit hotter and then they told me no it's not possible it's actually already on the lowest level because the building was built in the 70s and they expected that we could get more bipolar machines they built like a huge ac into the building and now we have to always put it on the highest setting and it's still too cool in the building yeah okay so um that was bipolar times um, and yeah, so IBM slowly started realizing we have to spend lots of engineering effort to get rid of all the heat. And in 1994, IBM started um, digging into the CMOS technology. Um, the CMOS technology allowed the machines to be a bit slower, the transistors could switch a little bit slower uh, initially, um, but they were running much cooler. Um, they built a, a, a line of machines um, which uh, based on, was based on the CMOS technology. Uh, they removed a few optional features, for example, the vector instructions. And the first CMOS machines, actually have to admit, they were not so nice. They were slow and like prototypey things. Um, but um, there was some application, but they were really, really were slow. And um, slowly IBM started evolving the CMOS technology 
technology and um, redesigning the CPUs. We found a paper that some they redesigned the CPUs at the time, um, and uh, CMOS was getting better and better and better. And at some point, it was actually better than a bipolar technology, and it didn't have as much hassle with the heat. Um, and with the fifth generation of this, this CMOS-based machines, uh, sixth generation, they were actually faster than the bipolar machines. And eventually, the whole mainframe moved from bipolar to CMOS technology. So um, one thing is what actually is interesting about the architecture too is ABM built machines that had more than two gigabytes of RAM end of the 80s. Yet our addresses were just 31 bits. So um, you kind of might ask the question, how can you do more than two gigabytes of RAM when you only have 32 one-bit addresses. So there are two things. Um, for example, for the uh, address space and the application, Claudio mentioned earlier the access register mode, um, which basically means that one application does not have one address space. One application can have up to 256 address spaces. So this way you can have an address space of effectively like uh, half, a, uh, half a terabyte um, for one application. Um, allowing the application to deal with a lot of data. Um, the second point is um, how can you actually physically address that memory, more than two gigabytes with only 31-bit addresses. And for that, IBM invented a concept that is called expanded storage. And expanded storage basically means that you can tell the machine, hey, I have this page here in physical memory, please put it in another thing that is almost as fast as my RAM, um, and then I can just take it back from there. So um, for a very, very long time, the mainframe was actually able to deal just fine with just 31 bits, and it also meant that you didn't have to do much adjustment to your application, um, and that's always important to keep compatibility with your applications. Um, but finally, in 2000, it happened, and the mainframe moved to 64 bits. Um, so what IBM basically did, we, uh, registers were extended to 64 bits. There were new instructions uh, that they could deal with the 64-bit uh, um, registers. Um, and um, we still kept the compatibility with 31-bit, uh, in fact, also 24-bit. So you can just run fine 24-bit uh, application, it's not a big problem. Um, page tables levels were extended, um, and you can basically say up on this point uh, the clone manufacturers are basically dead, so um, they could not keep up with the switch to 64 bits. I would just want to point out that the number of levels of page tables is variable per yeah. process. That's right. To, to not have, um, to, I mean, to help performance. Yeah. You know. Good, so let's take a, bit, look, a look a bit at the evolution. Um, and uh, with the C900 in uh, 2000, we get the so-called IFLs. IFLs are special processes that can only run Linux. Um, the idea is basically that if you only want to run Linux on a certain processor, um, you get that one cheaper. Um, with uh, C990, um, you get the CAAPs, which are again specialized processors that are meant to run databases and Java applications, also for licensing reasons. Um, with uh, in 2005, um, mainframes, they don't have a BIOS. We have something that is a little bit nicer. We have like a fancy web UI where you can configure your computer, how it's going to boot. Um, and this uh, HMC, we call it HMC, um, it, run, it ran uh, OS2, and in 2005 we actually finally switched to Linux for that. Um, we got uh, large pages, a little bit late to the party, but yeah, we got it. But later uh, than never. <laughs> yeah. um, in 2010, uh, our process reached a speed of 5.2 gigahertz. Uh, fastest clock speed at the time. Probably. Um, with C12, we got transactional memory. Um, with C13, we got vector instructions again differently. Uh, yes, yeah, different and incompatible <laughs> with the previous ones. But yeah, but we got them <laughs> now. Um, and we got SMT, so you can run multiple threads, uh, threads in one CPU, and that was mainly also made for Linux. Um, uh, with C14, we, so we stopped supporting 31 bit operating systems, which doesn't mean that you can still run 24-bit applications, just your operating system needs to be 64 bits. Um, and with C15, we get support for secure execution, which basically means running confidential VMs on, on your mainframe. Good, um, so uh, C16, I always forget that, so new. Um, we have Neural Network Assist, which is basically a neural network um, acceleration. Um, so let's take a look 
if you want to port Linux to your architecture, you need a compiler first. And for Linux, that basically means you need GCC. Um, so we first need to answer the question, how did GCC come to the mainframe? And if we dig into this a little bit, um, we find out that in October 1993, um, in GCC, code appears um, for the so-called i370 backend. Um, it was developed outside of IBM by someone who wanted to run applications or wanted to compile applications for the MVS operating system. Um, and it was really basically targeted at that. So you could compile applications for MVS and run it on the mainframe. Um, it was not really meant for operating systems and basically just for that purpose. And then for quite a long time, absolutely nothing happens. Um, in 1999, IBM, Seven. then, ah, 1997, yes, uh, IBM um, wants to replace internally a compiler they used, um, which was uh, um, developed at the end of the 80s. Um, and they're sort of, they're looking for a C compiler, um, and they take a look at this i370 backend for GCC. And um, while analyzing that, they find, um, yeah, you can actually port GCC and it works on the mainframe. Um, so they take a look at their requirements a little bit and they realize, yeah, but it's not quite that what we need. Um, so they start a new port, um, the so-called S390 port, um, which has less backward compatibility, hence also the different name, 390, um, 370. Um, and yeah, so they develop a GCC backend for, uh, for the mainframe. So in 1998, Linux ports to the mainframe start, um, and this further accelerates the development of the compiler. So for example, we get ELF support in GCC and other features that you need for operating system for Linux in general, um, yeah. And uh, finally, after quite some time, um, after the, the SV90 backend is maintained out of tree, um, but in 2001, uh, IBM finally upstreams the code and gives it to the Free Software Foundation, and since then, GCC um, can uh, use the SV90 uh, backend natively uh, in the upstream. Good. Now we have a compiler. Imagine you're employed at IBM, someone in maybe 90, uh, 1998. Um, you have this shiny new operating system, which is called Linux. You might playing, be playing around with it at home a little bit. And you have this nice GC compiler. So what do you do? Yeah, you basically start prototyping the port of Linux to the mainframe. And that's actually what happened. So um, in 1998, um, IBM engineers in their free time basically make a prototype. Uh, yeah, we can port Linux to the mainframe. And yeah, they show it to people and people seem to like it. And uh, IBM initially, um, yeah, makes it the official thing. Um, but they're a little bit hesitant. Um, so on the 18th of December 1999, the source code of the S390 port for uh, Linux is released, but just on IBM's FTP server. It's not like an upstream thing. It's first on IBM's uh, web server, uh, FTP server. You can download it from there. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's just an IBM thing uh, until in January 2000. Just a little bit later, it appears in the release of Linux of the Linux kernel. Um, so in Linux 2.2.14, um, Linux actually learns uh, how to run on the mainframe upstream. That was fast. That was really fast. So people seem to kind of like it. It seemed to be interesting for people. And very quickly after that, the first Linux distribution ap appears, the Marist Linux, which was basically only targeted to the mainframe. And yeah, so then Linux runs on the mainframe. That's basically the story. Um, so I mentioned earlier that there were actually ports of Linux to the mainframe. And um, there were two ports of Linux to the mainframe. There was the S390 port, which was developed by the IBM engineers that, uh, in their free time and then later made an official ID IBM project. And then there was also the i370 uh, port um, named after the GCC backend. Um, and this was developed outside of IBM. Um, it, it was developed by people that did not have access to the newest shiny machines. Um, so the i370 um, port was co also compatible with older older boxes. Um, it also used a little bit of a different syntax, so it's more familiar to people that um, program the mainframe to understand the code. Uh, while S390 uses a little bit more um, yeah, different syntax. 
Um, it also uses a completely different tool chain. The S390 port uses the GZ S390 uh, tool chain, and the i370 port uses the i370 um, tool chain of GCC. Um, you have to say that i370 was certainly less stable than S3, uh, S390 port. Um, I read online that it could boot and it could spawn a shell as the init process but then it tried to open the console and it crashed. So uh, you got fire, but it was not very useful. So um, yeah, but you certainly have to acknowledge by someone who is a volunteer who does it, does it basically outside of IBM, it was actually considerable achievement. Um, and yeah, the, because the S390 was uh, by, done by IBM employees, yeah, of course. And um, the i370 port was then later abandoned when the S390 port was published by IBM. Yeah, so that's the story of the two ports of uh, Linux to the mainframe. Good, so the f question that I ask, why was this interesting? I mean, this uh, that uh, the, the source code came into Linux kernel so quickly um, and people built Linux distributions for it and there was general interest on this, why? Um, and these are the reasons that I found. Maybe there are more, but this is what I found. Um, so first reason that I found is consolidation. So in the 2000s, the data center looked like it was boxes. So you had one box for the web server, you had one box for the database server, you had another box for the mail server, then you had another box for the FTP server and whatnot. You had just an absurd amount of boxes in your data center. And uh, with the mainframe, um, because the mainframe knows virtualization quite well, um, and with CVM and Linux, you could basically just put all that boxes on a single mainframe. So it was kind of attractive because this would save space in your mainframe. It would save hassle by running around and replacing hardware all the time. It would uh, save also energy. So this was one reason why people said Linux is interesting because I can just take CVM and Linux and run all my boxes uh, on the mainframe. Second reason that I found Java, people really like Java, um, they wanted to run Java applications, um, okay they did, maybe, I don't know why, um, and it worked well on Linux, so um, yeah, it was attractive for people to run Java applications on Linux. Um, Another reason was um, Unix. So application vendors often said that, um, yeah, we want a Unix-like OS. Um, and yeah, that was another reason. Um, yeah, Unix-like OS, uh, why not Linux? Um, also save costs. I think that was also a very important point. It's a comparatively cheap operating system. Mainframe operating systems are expensive. expensive. Um, and um, later IBM also introduced, I already mentioned it, uh, cheaper CPUs that could only run Linux, the so-called IFLs. And um, I think you also have to mention this, it was just cool. I mean, people liked it. They were just, they liked Linux, they ran it at home maybe, so they also maybe wanted it on their mainframe. Good, so let's take a little bit, a uh, look at, uh, at the evolution of the Linux kernel. Um, in 1999, Linux for S390 is published. Um, in 2001, Linux learns how to run on a 64-bit uh, S390X architecture. That's what we call the 64-bit uh, variant. Um, the 64-bit kernel, of course, can run the 31-bit user space just fine and still do that today. Um, in 2003, uh, the mainframe gets, or Linux gets, uh, SCSI support. Uh, up until that point, you had to have a specialized storage for mainframe, so you had to buy a specialized storage box just for your mainframe, um, which was expensive, and you maybe already had a SCSI storage around somewhere. Um, so since 2003, you can use your SCSI storage um, with a mainframe. Um, 2008, uh, the Linux kernel learned how to run VMs on the mainframe. Um, uh, yeah, so what what demonstrates the virtualization capability is at uh, KVM Forum 2008. IBM showed a mainframe or a Linux partition on the mainframe that ran like two 200 uh, Linux VMs, which is, I mean, quite a lot. So it shows that the platform can do virtualization quite well. Um, in 2013, uh, the Linux kernel learns how to talk to PCI devices um, on the mainframe. Um, it's basically a more standard interface to the hardware, like for NVMEs, for network cards, for hardware security modules. Um, but you don't have to believe that you can just take any hardware and plug it into the mainframe. Most of the time you still need specialized hardware that um, yeah, has some adjustments. And also, if you're wondering why um, 
uh, this came so PCI support came so late is because well mainframes had um, um, channel I/O which was actually quite good, uh, or very good. So the, the PCI was not needed basically until 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 it was, which is still quite late. So in 2015, uh, IBM releases the Linux One, a uh, specialized system that can only run Linux. Um, the idea basically is that you all again save costs um, because with a, a traditional mainframe you need to have at least one um, processor that is a non-IFL processor. With Linux One, you can uh, run uh, just Linux uh, and again save a little bit of cost if you intend just to run Linux. 2017, the mainframe gets support for SMC, which is basically a socket-like connection that is uh, in the background uh, shared memory, it works locally and also remotely between mainframes. And in 2020, um, Linux learns how to run uh, confidential VMs uh, with secure execution. And for secure execution, Claudio has a talk. Yeah, I mean, secure execution alone is a whole talk, which I have already given, actually, uh, the KVM forum in 2019. So if you're interested, just uh, look that up or, or talk to us afterwards. So these are a few references that we have. You can find the documentation, all the, the, the manuals, the principles of operations, as we call them, the manual that describes the instructions and the CPUs, some extensions. You can look them up um, using these this numbers, and then you will find the documents. Um, and in case you want to play with it, buy a mainframe. Yeah, um, maybe not. <laughs> no, not really. Okay, so if you have an application and you want to try it on Big Endian, you can actually use this link, uh, sign up there, and then you will get a Linux VM running on a mainframe. So in case you have something and you want an architecture as Big Endian, or maybe you like the mainframe, you can just sign up there and you get a VM and you can try software on it and play with it, play with Linux a little bit. Um, in case you enjoyed. Um, and then there's also CPDT, which basically allows you to run COS, but it's also expensive and a product. Um, and there is also QMU that can emulate a newer, newer mainframe hardware. And for all the hardware, there's other emulators um, you can use and software, Claudio. Yeah, well, copyright worked differently in the 70s. And if you did not put a copyright notice in your software or whatever you were publishing, then it was not copyrighted. And uh, IBM didn't bother to protect their operating systems in the beginning, because why? What does, does, if, you, if you get the OS, then you're going to buy a mainframe to run it, right? So who cares? Um, then the clones started to arrive, and they started to care. Uh, but um, So you can get, still get OS 360 and DOS 360 and DOS 360 uh, for free. They're literally public domain. You can just Google and you find it. And for VM, you can actually get even VM 370 public domain, because IBM didn't care about VM in the beginning, because they were pushing, pushing uh, TSS, which you can also find, because didn't really go well. So if you want to play a little bit with these things, you can literally just Google. You will find uh, websites where you can just download uh, uh, an image uh, ready to run in, a, in an emulator. Good. And the file. Any questions? Uh, my question is, how many p of your customers are still running non-Linux applications? And are there special features to communicate between Linux and the other operating systems? Um, I actually don't know how many customers do. Uh, there are special features, uh, I think it's called hypersockets, uh, that you can use to communicate between CUS instances and Linuxes. And many customers use it to have like a legacy application on CUS, and then you have like a fancy Java, Linux, Node, whatever application that talks to your uh, traditional application. Yeah, but the numbers, like, we, we, we don't know. I mean, someone at IBM does know, but not us. It's not us. <laughs> I found one point missing on your reason or list of reasons. There's many things missing in this presentation. Okay. Trust me. <laughs> we brought the presentation and we, like, we had to throw away like two thirds of it because. <laughs> but yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Customer of mine um, uh, bought uh, mainframes larger than their uh, mainframe uh, usage. So they had to think about how can we put load on the mainframe that uh, isn't generated by batch processing. And that's the reason why they in, 
Yeah, adopted Linux on the mainframe. Oh, okay. The CPU got that faster than the usage that they had reserved they could use uh, cheaper. <laughs> okay, interesting. Interesting detail. I noticed that the version numbering was a bit weird. Like yeah, I from didn't Z count. 990 to Z9 and then up again and at some point there were other jumps. Is there a reason for that? Like marketing. So so, so no. it's just like um just like uh Apple skipping numbers. Yeah, actually if we go back, we can see something interesting. If we go back to the S3 here, you see G1, G2, the generation 1, generation 2, uh, G5, G6, and then we jump to uh, Z900 because it sound, sounded cool, and then Z990, but then it's Z9. Why? Why? <laughs> because this was G7, this was G8, this is G9, G10. Um, uh, th they decided <laughs> to do something else here, and then we're back on track. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's marketing. Uh, um, I, I hope they, they will stay like this, but it's not in our control. It's not AppStick. It's just, we can't count. Um, so thanks, oh, uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. Um, IBM has another kind of obscure hardware platform with the power um, platform. And I spent a lot of time working with power. And um, power has the uh, neat possibility to run SMT8. So basically, eight threads on one core, which is kind of crazy. So I was puzzled a bit whether this is also available on the mainframe or whether we are talking S SMT2 here. SMT2. OK, thanks. <laughs> 